No, the SS form, form, SS form, I think it's for, uh, are you talking about the 25 to get a hold of the bond? Yeah, did you use that one? No, because I, I'm, I am just requesting funds. Okay, I, I was thinking about requesting funds and I saw that possibly uh, the SF-1080 form could be used. Yes, I, I looked at that. Uh, basically, the 1099A served that purpose. Because remember, on his original list for the Social Security Morton Main account, he didn't include a 1099A. So, so basically, it's my draft, my affidavit with the Social Security card on it, 1099A, requesting the amount, voucher to pay against, the uh, deposit showing the account that I want to do, and uh, the two fiduciary forms giving me the authority to find the uh, 56, 56 assets that have to be given, give you the authority to do this. So, but you would you would use that to think of 1080 if you were in receipt. And the, and the request for funds. Okay. Well, I was thinking of doing some set offs. I think I was thinking probably an SF 1080 would would go there. I don't think for set offs. You know, just specifically for refunds. I have a question for you guys. Have you sent, before you did that, did you send a demand notice? You mean the one that Patrick posted today? Uh, honestly, I'm I'm not sure. I This is the first time I've called into you guys. I just got pretty much, I ran through, listened to all the calls, I've looked at all your documentation. I've been into this kind of stuff for the last 15 years or so. I live in Des Moines. Um, but uh, my my thought on the process has always been treat it like they're in dishonor of, of the situation to begin with. You know, tell them they have you you expect this amount of money in this amount of time. Otherwise, you expect the instrument back, or they're in dishonor of the instrument, and then pursue it to the, the fullest you can after it. Well, the three day three day demand letter Patrick uh, put up today. I see could either be sent with with the uh, this, this package that I'm sending in, or could be sent in three days if it's all done. Uh, I, I, would, I would assume they need the form 56 and 56F, and an affidavit. What is, what is the uh, other form that you guys are talking about? I'm talking about a number of forms. Have you have you looked at the current document? Uh, where can I find that? I'll take a look at that. Okay, it's in. It's on. Are you in the Yahoo group? Yeah, I uh, joined that a couple days ago. Okay, that that will be in the most recent folder called Treasury Accounts. Okay. Uh, but, there's two zip files that uh, all together in the zip files. I think there's 29 documents. And uh, there have been some more documents added. Those are the documents we're talking about. And on the backup, I have not only the zip files there, but I also have them expanded to folders if you want to work with that. It's probably easier to, down easier to download the zip files and expand it on your computer. Sure. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your name is uh, Tom? Yeah. Uh, are you the gentleman who puts the files up there? Yes. I just want to say thank you for uh, for everything that you do. You're welcome. Well, well, you know, just <laughs> doing that helps me learn. So I don't I don't mind it at all. Okay, it's Patrick. I'm on the line now. Hi, Patrick. You got the recording going? Yeah, the recording is going. Okay. Yeah, what I sent to Tom today basically was uh, a couple documents. Uh, one, uh, 
that I call the three-day uh, document, basically just giving them notice that they have three days to process this because this is a banking transaction, okay? It's a treasury slash banking transaction. And just because, in most cases, they're the government, does not ex uh, exempt them from also being classified as a bank and that they have to fall under the banking laws, rules, and regulations also. They have to operate under the statutes at large and the Constitution out here. Okay, and the three-day law has been a gospel uh, in law for a long, long time. Now, the $5,000 penalty applies to all government uh, offices and uh, employees of the government. All those $5,000 frivolous filing penalties, they're against an employee of the government. They're not against a private citizen. The statutes at large do not apply to the private citizens. They only apply to corporations. And basically that's all that the Constitution and the statutes apply to. That's what uh, most people don't understand. They're trying to get you to claim to be a employee of the government in all cases. You're not, okay? You stand by the real laws out here. So we can basically rebut them. Okay, and you do that by affidavit. We live by affidavit. And the public, they're operating as protected fictional persons, <clears throat> okay, in their capacity. They're under bondage or bonds in their endeavor, liability bonds. That's what gave them their out, okay, when they brought that into play. And they've used that basically to overstep many of their uh, authority out here, thinking that they're totally protected in all regards. They're not. When you understand how this thing operates and functions. Now, it's all about banking. It's a Mortemain account. They're in violation of the laws of the land. That's why this accounts are held o overseas or out the sea in Puerto Rico. That's why Puerto Rico will never become a state of the union because of the accounts that they're holding there for the people and the government are classified as mortemains, and that's against the statutes and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Okay. More domains are basically holding something out of circulation for the benefit of corporations. Okay. They're not for the benefit of the living individuals. That is what and so is. that's against the total law of the universe in that process. Is that you, Sifrucht? I don't know what you want to call it. I call it Mortemain. Look up the definition of Mortemain, and basically you'll see it. I post had, had those uh, documents posted up there about Mortemain before. I think uh, one of the reasons why I've sort of been, uh, over the last couple of years, been backed off from is because I've used that term Mortemain. And uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been trying to do. Now, one thing that we didn't understand was that we needed to be a banker. The whole Bible is about banking, private banking or commercial banking. Bottom line, that you were banked upon the earth. Okay, so you are a banker. You operate in barter in your endeavor, in the private. 
but you're still classified as a private banker or private bank. <laughs> okay? And then you have to put a fictional person out in front of you. And that's clearly identified in the Bible numerous times over. Having a fictional person out in front of you. He's getting most of the credit. You're sitting back getting the rewards. But like so many people in this uh, nation, they feel left out if they're not up front there getting all the credit. I mean, there's numerous times of that. Uh, pride and arrogance, uh, you overstep that, and basically you get in trouble. See, people don't know how and don't understand what the Bible is really saying. Okay? They all think it's a religious book, and then they shun away from it, from looking at it from any other aspect. Pride, arrogance, uh, vanity, you name it. It all deals with banking. Now, the three-day rule basically applies. The other document that I had put up there, Harold found that when I told him about the uh, Bureau of Fiscal Services, F-I-S-C-A-L, Services. And that was the fiscal officers that we were looking for, and I was looking for, for about the last four or five years when they set up this independent treasury back in the 1920s or 19-teens, whenever it came about. So all this stuff is basically in the statutes. It's all applying to the government and how they deceived the people and took the controls away from the people and tried to make them employees of the government. This also applies to the military and what they did in the uh, 30, 1935 when they brought in the Social Security Administration system, that they were already doing it Back in the uh, 19-teens, allowing the Federal Reserve to write trade acceptances against uh, the employees of, like, Ford Motor Company and most of the big manufacturing companies. Mm. It was all a means to get the labor for banking purposes so that the companies could borrow money at a cheaper rate. So they put the employees up as collateral and until they brought around the Social Security system, then they started bringing funds out of the uh, Treasury, out of the de jure Treasury, and putting it into a Social Security independent Treasury account. The certificate of live birth is not worth 600 and some thousand dollars, like a lot of people have out there. No, the initial deposit of that 600 or whatever million dollars was initially into your Social Security account, your Mortar Main account that's held down in Puerto Rico. That's what funded all your education. They wrote bonds against that. Okay? You were supposed to be able to start accessing that when you turned 18 because it's your bank. It said right on the uh, application or the documents for the Social Security. You own this account. This is your account. The government cannot own anything. They're a corporation. And corporations are fictional and they own nothing. Period. 
I've told you this before, numerous times. Now, they try and deceive you and take things away from you, but that still does not mean that they have the right of ownership because they cannot own anything. They claim rights to things, but it's all under bondage. Your certificate of title to your vehicle, your certificate of title to your house, your mortgage, whatever, they're under bondage. You have to claim the bond as you are the real owner. And then you bring that bond into settlement. against your more domain account. Several people have gone into court. You can look at that one court document that I posted up there that one of the guys had out there. But he was claiming that the Social Security number with the dashes was a QCIP number. It's not. It is a bank routing number. All bank routing numbers have nine digits, and they're either one or two dashes in the bank routing number. Most commercial bank routing numbers have start off with two digits, a dash, then several more digits, then a dash, and then another digit or two. Okay? Or bank routing number is the prime one is the social security number it starts off with three but it's a treasury bank routing number so it can start with three then dash two then dash uh, the remainder your EINs they are routing numbers but they only have one dash in them. And in most cases, they're only a withdrawing routing number. You withdraw something from a fund. So it's got one dash. When you take the dashes out of your Social Security number, that gives you the account number. For people that have military service, it's the Mortemain, military Mortemain account. And there's one down in Puerto Rico there, too. And the routing number is your Social Security number. But the account number is your selected service number. There is no dashes in a selected service number. There were spaces, but you don't record the spaces. What do you always give when they ask you your Social Security number? Well, you give them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You don't put, say, dash after the first three numbers, and then two, and then dash after that. You just give them the number. That's your bank account number. They record it as with the dashes in it, most of the people. But when it gets to the chief financial officer of the organization in the paperwork, they normally know what to do with that. The president of the bank, he don't know. The account manager, they don't know. The clerks, they don't know. But the chief financial officer knows that that social security number is both a routing number and an account number. The Federal Reserve knows that too. They've been dealing with this treasury bank for a long time this Mortemain Treasury Bank. 
The number on the back of your Social Security card, that is the bondage number. That is the QCIP number of the bond that they have over that Social Security account because the government uses that Social Security account when they write all their bills in, in Congress, in mm-hmm. legislature. They need to have funding for that. So they bill each one of these Social Security accounts by way of the bond that they already have in place, which is the number on the back of your Social Security card, that QCIP number. Like I said on Sunday night, this is not rocket science. But we've been misled by so many of these gurus out here that have led people totally astray and not one of them ever said anything about a bank routing number or about getting an individual banker's EIN number. You need to have the individual banker's EIN number because you have to have somebody that can stand both in the public world and the private world. He is basically your boatman to go between the living and the dead. All these stories, fairy tales, myths, and everything else, they've been telling a lot of this stuff in the movies. The same stories have been over and over again. Now, one thing we have to understand is if you send these into the Social Security office, they may not know, but you need to know where they need to go to. That You need to tell them. They need to send it up the line to the Social Security Administration. Okay? There's two areas. You've got the Social Security Administration out in Maryland. And they see you've got another United States Social Security Administration in Springfield, Missouri. That's the western area that deals with the western depository. The one in Maryland is dealing with the eastern depository people. From there it goes up to the either the Philadelphia Finance Center or the Kansas City Finance Center. Now, in both levels, there are certifying officers at the Social Security local office, at that uh, administrative office, Social Security administrative office, and basically also at uh, the final certifying officer is at that Kansas City or Philadelphia Finance Center. That's what that book was referring to, the certifying officers, that PDF. (laughs) And they have to authorize the the final signature. When I basically was getting uh, reapplied for my Social Security, they've been withholding funds out of my account. For their benefit, okay, they didn't want to stop their benefit, even though I stopped mine. They didn't stop theirs. So they owed me roughly uh, sixty to $70,000. The lady down at the local office told me it has to go through three levels of approval. Now I know where the three levels are. And when I started complaining to the Social Security Inspector General, that's when it moved off of dead center. Now, as soon as we understand that this is all about banking, and you put that three-day document in there, you should be moving that off of dead center. They can't sit on that. Because if you read that certifying uh, officer manual, 
you will see that those certifying officers can be charged in the process. They can be charged for harm if they don't process those items. They either need to reject it or approve it, that they can't sit on it. Sitting on something is causing harm. And that's just like a false approval that was fraudulent. Because in a lot of cases, who is continuing to benefit from it? They are. By not releasing it. All these courts have basically tried to operate for their benefit. They haven't released the bonds so that you can make a settlement. They took our money away from us and basically they put bonds in place. The bonds were supposed to be settling the accounts. But the people didn't know that they had to come in and claim the bond and then give the bond up for settlement. The funds are in the bonds. Even a 1099 against what you had paid in. You don't need to do a 1099. You claim the bond and then basically you process, have the bond processed. They've either got it under an SF 24, 25, or 25A. Now, at the federal level, they're operating under the SF 273, 274, and 275. Under the SF forms. If you had already paid into it and not claimed the bond previously and you were working through something and you're going back on it, how long do those bonds last? Do they have an expiration? I don't know. They see three years in most cases. That's what I was I was assuming. Do they three years? Uh, thirty years uh, for a mortgage, thirty year mortgage. Basically, they'll keep those bonds open as long <laughs> as they can. Who is the correct person or entity to go to to claim the bond? For court action, you have to go and demand it from the court. What about for legal title? For a bank, you have to go to the bank. For a state action, you're going to have to demand it from uh, the treasurer. And who super, I, I'm in your state. Who supersedes the treasurer in this state? Who supersedes the treasurer? Is there a uh, inspector general? For yeah, that? Tom Miller. Yeah, he's been in there long enough. He knows all the tricks of the trade. He's supposed to be the attorney general. He's supposed to be working for the people. Well, you might have to come up to your morning and help me with a couple things. and You can have the money. I don't care. No, but see, I went up there. And the only one that I've ever really talked to, I've never talked to Miller. I've been up there to see him several times, but all I got was one of his agents, mm-hmm. even the Secretary of State. I've never talked to him. The only one I've talked to is the treasurer several times. Until the last couple of times, and he didn't want to talk to me, he sent his head guy out to talk to me. That's what I'm expecting is a runaround. Well, you can expect it. You're not going to get it when you know what you're talking about. When you bring out the right things, they will deal with you. They will deal with you. Okay, this is important to me. Just like that, read that court document that I posted up there. When that guy used, and he basically was touching close on it, uh, the QCIP number and the auto trust number. But if he would have said bank routing number and then the account number and then the QCIP number, 
Somebody's got feedback going. I just I just muted them. There's a lot of background noise. It's getting hard to hear you. I but just muted is, that. They were they were talking in the background. But that's it. I mean, basically understand that uh, uh, banking uh, document. It's only four pages, and I tried to highlight certain things in there. Uh, no, you, you do a the guy job. did a pretty good job. Mm-hmm. He gave me a lot of thought process in understanding what was going on here after I'd already come up with the individual bankers, EIN, and I don't know why I came up with that, but that was back in April. And see, that individual banker is not a government banker. He is our private banker. He is our employee. He is not a government employee. Okay? Why you people to understand that? His EIM belongs to us. His is actually an employment EIM. And he's a non paid employee. Because he's our employee. He works for peanuts. Below the minimum wage, non-taxable, because in the private, our stuff is non-taxable if we stay away from usury. The only thing that they can tax, just like back in Moses' time, or the early Hebrew time in Egypt was the theoretic dead man's tax. The first pharaohs basically started out in the book of Joshua. Very interesting book that was totally left out of the Bible for a good reason because it would have exposed most of this banking system to the people. The guy set up with 30 thugs at the gates of the cemetery to start taxing the dead. You had to pay 200 shackles or whatever to bury the dead. He became the first pharaoh, supposedly, in the story. But if you study the uh, Mayans, the Incas, all of these basically were dealing with the dead over the people, taxing the dead and making the living pay the debt of the dead. Even Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. You deal with the living. I mean, basically, in so many of his parables, it tells you a lot about what is going on in the banking system. Now, the other item that I told Tom about earlier, on the back of your check or your draft under the endorsement. Now, you can change that around if you don't have a direct express card. You can modify that and have that basically being uh, distributed to, and basically that's what you want to make is a distribution, okay? Read the definition that is in Ballant or Bouvier's dictionary about distribution. You're the master of your ship. You can order up the distribution. But who basically 
makes the distribution. Quarter Normally on a ship, it's the yeoman. Or in uh, other places, they're called the quartermaster. They're the certifying officer that basically has to certify the delivery of the check or the distribution. Didn't didn't you uh, bring up the term disbursement too? Yes. No distribution. Okay. Not disbursement, distribution. And see, that's I saw that in that certifying officers PDF, and that's when I went and looked up the definition again because. We've gone through, but I don't remember ever going and looking at that word. And it's not in Valentine's Dictionary. I looked there. And the one that's in Black's Dictionary is just the one simple first paragraph out of Bouvier's. But in Bouvier's, the number three also addresses the, as a guardian, an executor, or a trustee. And we see we're coming in as a public trustee. Our individual banker is stepping in in the capacity as a public trustee to order up this disbursement. Or distri- distribution. Okay. And then basically it's got to have a certifying officer. So you can modify that. Either you have it deposited into your account, whether it be your direct express account, whether it be your local commercial bank account, or you have it uh, given over to a third party. You can modify that endorsement on the back of that uh, draft. Now, after that information is on there, you draw a line across, and then down below that line, you put FISCA, F-I-S-C-A-L, Certifying Officer Endorsement. And then you've got the middle part of it that's left blank until you get down to the bottom statement that I have there about uh, the law. These are not all cut and dry. You can modify these however you feel. It's your draft. What you feel comfortable that you can defend, that is what you make it. But you've got to have the bank routing number, which is the treasury bank routing number, and then the account number. So you've got, you'll have, you may have three different types of drafts. You may have the one for the Social Security account with the Social Security bank routing number. You may have a selective service account number with the Social Security bank routing number for your military account, draft, treasury draft. Your third one would be basically your BC draft against the du jour treasury of the country operated under your registration number without any dashes in it as the account number. And then the bank routing number on that is basically going to be the Foreign Grantor Trust, EIM. Normally, you have to get that one out of Philadelphia. It had to come from Philadelphia. If you set up a Foreign Grantor Trust any other way, 
then getting it authorized out of Philadelphia is not really the right one to access the Philadelphia Treasury or the Kansas City or, I mean, Springfield depository account. We have two depositaries in this country. We got an eastern depository and a western depository. The initial western depository was located in Cairo, Illinois. Right there, it was trying to tell you something. Cairo, the Great Pyramid, the capstone of the Great Pyramid was solid gold. When the Hebrews left town, they took the gold with them. But not, it didn't, the Hebrews did not take it all. There was others that took part of it that they were entitled to because the Hebrews were not the only ones that were placed into slavery or captivity in Egypt. Most all of the people in Africa were placed in there. Okay? And a lot of those guys were classified now as the Moors, and they went to the West. But there was other ones that went south, down into Ethiopia, and on further south in Africa. There were some that ended up going over to the Polynesian Islands. See, people think that they know everything about history. They don't know one iota. The amount of history that most people know could probably fit on their thumbnail. That's how educated the people are about history and about the whole system that has been operating out here because they don't have any comprehension of what the Bible is really saying. And then they don't want to go and look at it because they're all scared of it because they think it's all about a religion out here. And basically, these guys are trying to control us. And basically, I'm not going to believe this guy. But that's the truth. And yes, the truth hurts. Especially when you found out that you've been lied to, even by grandpa and grandma. Because they didn't know. And they were lied to it and misguided. Because everybody wants to go out here and just work and just be a happy little slave working for the man, as old Tennessee and Report says. <laughs> Indoctrination. But that's pretty much it. Patrick, I got a question. Yeah. <clears throat> I have uh, two Social Security cards with uh, numbers on the back different. So um, they have two bonds created under my uh, name underneath that number? They may, may not. Okay, you'd have to check it. All right. Normally they take the one bond and replace it with the other. I would so think. If they replace it, I have to use the newest one then. Yes, but I would check it out. And who would you check it out with? Social Security office. No. No. Nope. Nope. Go into that Bureau of Fiscal Services. Bureau of Fiscal Services. It's in the Treasury Department, okay? Even though they claim on the website to be under the Department of Treasury, it's a bureau. It's not a department. Right. Okay? Okay. So it's in the de jure side. It's not in the de facto side.
de facto is something that is a department of something. State of Iowa. State yeah, of, of California. That's a derivative of the original state government. Right. What have we been hearing about for the last 10, 15 years? Derivatives in mm-hmm. the financial markets. That's the big thing. Is derivatives. <clears throat> And basically, they're operating bonds in this derivative market. All right, I'll give him a call and see what I come up with. Appreciate it. Scan a copy of it and basically send it in. Say, I want to know what the status of this bond is. I want to know how much my account is. That was one of the other things on that one document, that three-day document, you could put on there that basically also, uh, after the settlement of this item, I want to know what my account balance is. Hmm. That certified officer has to certify that the funds are there so he knows how much funds are there. So he can tell you. Especially the final certifying officer. Then when you get ready to collapse your account, you will basically collapse it by going to this uh, Kansas City or Philadelphia Finance Center. And it's the Financial Management System, FMS. I tried to go there to them a couple years ago, but I did not know, have the understanding about the banker's EIN, about the bank account, and I did not have my individual banker's EIN for my private bank person, my private bank employee. I just got seven letters Monday from the IRS. <laughs> about seven new letters. Seven letters that basically I'd gotten about six months ago that I'd gotten previously six months before that for seven items. Three against Patrick Paul Devine and four against Patrick Devine under the same social security number. Looking at the payment stub down on the bottom, it has your SSN number with the dashes. But at the very bottom of the page, the first thing it is, is your social security number without any dashes, then a KV, and then the first four letters of your last name. Right there, it's got the bank routing number and the bank account number right on that payment stub. All you had to do was basically initiate or initial or endorse that payment stub and come in and order them to process it from your account. But see, people never looked at it from that aspect because they didn't know what they were looking at. But it was standing right there looking them in the face. And they did not have eyes to see what they were looking at. What the difference was. And asked the question, why? And I've said this for years. We were told to read the Bible as a little child. 
you have, and the little child always asks the question, why, Mommy? Why, Daddy? That when Mommy and Daddy and teachers and everybody else and the religious leaders don't know the answer, you'll never find it out unless you go out and think on your own and try and put logic and common sense into how the system really functions. Not how you think they're operating, but how it actually has to function. And people have been doing a lot of misthinking in this process. And then, in a lot of cases, they haven't been doing any thinking at all, and they've been going and listening to all these other guys out here that have been totally misleading them, telling them to trust, or telling them it's this thing, or telling them it's that thing. Go here, go there, type scenario. You got to stop and smell the roses. Smell what's real. Know what's shit and know what's beauty. You've got to find the real thing in the beast. Like beauty in the beast. But that's not all there is to it. It's all there if you want to look for it, okay? And you want to operate it. I've given you the answers. Now, you just have to put them down. And basically, I've given you most of the documents, too. If you can pull up the documents and you don't have Word uh, Microsoft Word, then take the documents and make up your own documents. If you need to, there's check writing programs out there for you to write your own checks out with that with Microsoft Word, I made these up myself. I'm a creator. I don't know what you guys are, but I can create just about anything I want. You're supposed to have that God-given talent, too, because you are a God. It says that right in the Bible several times. Ye are gods. I didn't get any of this from a hocus pocus fly by the ass out here in Never Never Land. I got it from my spirit of understanding. You've got the same capacity. You just have to start utilizing it. And stop living in fear. I don't know how many movies are out there about that. You cannot live in fear. Basically, that's in the Ghost Rider, that first movie about the Ghost Rider with Nicolas Cage. You can't live in fear. The government only operates in implying fear over the people. That's the only way they can control you, is to make you fear them. Bingo. Now, when you stop fearing them, and you start standing up to them, and you understand that all these courts out here are corporate courts, 
They all have gun numbers. The police departments, all the deputies and the sheriff's department, they're employees of a corporation. They're nothing more than Walmart security guards. <clears throat> they really do not have jurisdictional control over the living. They can only basically operate over a dead employee. That they have a jurisdictional control over. Because they're really dead employees too. But now when you get your banker's EIA and you understand the laws of banking and you have your banker, individual banker, he can step in in both worlds, out of the private world into the public world. <laughs> he can go into their world as basically the beneficial owner of that account for the fiduciary who is your private bank. You as the living are in the background. You're not to be seen. Stop using pride and everything to be out front. Use your protections that basically have been put here eons ago. All the way back to Cain and Abel. That was the one of the very first banking actions out here. But basically, the eating the apple by Eve and Adam was the first contract in the commercial banking system. Which sort of goes back to the old fairy tale of Rumpelstiltskin. Same scenario. It's just a remake of Adam and Eve. Placing Cain in bondage. See, when you start looking at these things, then you can start thinking outside the box and start putting the pieces to the puzzle together. I don't know what more I can say. So basically I'll open it up for questions and basically uh, uh, try and take a look at those documents. Start hitting these people up. So basically I've addressed with these documents that I submitted out to Tom today that he posted up. Okay? Don't argue with them, Okay? You do not argue. You're there to settle. You're either settling the court case, the bank note, the bonds, whatever. But you have to demand the bond to be brought forth because basically that bond really belongs to you. You will settle it. If you do not claim those bonds, and you pay out of your back pocket. After about three years, they will turn around and write a 1099A claiming those bonds as abandoned funds. The 1099As and all that are for the commercial bankers. We really don't need to do them. We're in the private. All we have to do is put our draft or our claim in. Now, one of the other things on that draft, I up there where it says red official issue or original issue, I changed that to credit 
distribution. Because that's what we're doing. We're having a distribution of the credits in that account. And then our individual banker as the fiduciary and the trustee is basically issuing that out. With the negative value, correct? Yeah. You bring it in their world, credits are negative. Debt is positive. In the real world, debt is negative and credits are positive. Okay? Got it. Yeah. It's that simple. Whenever you get a bill from them, what's it? It's always positive. It's a debt. So what do you have to do to cancel a positive? You have to give a negative. And then when you bring it into the real world, it turns from a negative into a positive. The other side of a looking glass, Alice. See how many of these stories I just went through, movies and everything else, telling you all this stuff. And I am not a wizard. I am not a genius. I'm just someone that basically will not stand by and believe all the BS. I'm an individual. I'll make up my own beliefs and understandings. I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to believe because that's the First Amendment in the Constitution about religion. And the government does not, cannot infringe upon that by creating all these false religions that they've created out here. False belief, and that's all religion is, is a belief. Getting you to believe something that is totally against the truth. Okay. Any questions, comments, rebuttals, whatever? Patrick, these drafts you send in, are they sent on check paper or are you sending this on regular paper? It doesn't regular matter. Regular printer paper. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Because I'm going to do it by hand. I think I'm going to just write it out. Let me ask you something about the uh, DD-214. You mentioned that, but you said you should get it certified first uh, before sending it. Uh, for a draw against the... Um, uh, you take your original certificate. You should have a wet ink signature copy of your DD-214, your discharge paper. I do. Okay, your original one uh, from your... Uh, see, like I had eight years of service, so I got two DD-214s. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a DD-214 every, basically every four years of service that you did. That's correct. But the original one basically has your selective service number on it, okay? Yeah. My selective service number didn't appear on the second one because the second one is not the one that is needed. It's the original DD-214 that you get that will have your selective service number on it, okay? That is your basically your military bank account is the selective service number. Yeah, for mine, is the same as the social. On mine, it's the same. This, this no, level of service. you've got to have your selective service number. They're two different numbers. Mm -hmm. Your selective service number should have been an 11-digit number. 
okay? And basically, that was uh, uh, initially, that was uh, uh, against the du jour treasury, but they moved it out under Eisenhower down into a Mortimain account down in Puerto Rico. Gotcha. See, initially, the military selective service was basically under the du jour treasury, just like the birth certificate. Normally, it was an 11-digit number, except for a few states like Pennsylvania and maybe Mass or Boston area or whatever. They operated under very different numbers. But uh, they're in the system in that regard, and when you send a copy of those in, they at the, the uh, finance center, okay, either there in Philadelphia or Kansas City, they will know and recognize that from the document and where it came from. But under Eisenhower, they basically then uh, they tricked JFK into being the final cog to uh, move all the military bounty assets over into this Mortimane account which is basically being held under Title 46, the Shipping Act. Okay? So we had a merchant, uh, civilian, seaman, and then you had a merchant, military, seaman account under Title 46, Chapter 73. You uh, are... I don't know where I posted it up there yet or not, but basically the document with the Social Security card doing an affidavit against that and then an endorsement on the back about the bond number and doing a partial withdrawal against that bond, uh, you would need to do a similar type endorsement on the back of the DD-214. The same thing you would have to do on the back of a cop certified copy of your uh, certificate of live birth, which is really your birth certificate. The certificate of live birth was just the initial filing. After that, when it comes out under state seal and Bureau of Vital Statistics seal, it now becomes an official birth certificate. Okay? I got you. But you need to get certified copies of the DD-214, and how you do that is you take that DD-214 down to the county recorder's office, and you put it into the military discharge book. Got it. And then it doesn't cost you anything. You give them the original, they will give they will run a copy of it, scan it in, and give you the original back, and then you can go down there and you can request as many certified copies as you want. And they're all free coming out in the military side. Good stuff. Thanks, Pat. Okay. Hey, Patrick? Yes. I, I'm, uh, my package for the funding that I'm going to send in, I, I, I gather I should add the three-day notice to that and let them know right away they they better have behave. And, uh, you're, you're just I'm giving them advance notice. Basically, you can even reference that uh, uh, certified officer's manual if you want to. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Think about this. Hey. What do you want to tell them? Here, it's in your own damn document. Right, right. And then from what you're saying is that the, the, the 1099A I was going to send in may not be necessary since I'm not a, a public bank. Right. Okay. Now, this a three-day document. For the, I have a bunch of set-offs that didn't work. Should I send that three-day notice all over to them to try to get them fired up? They see why it didn't work, okay? In most cases, uh, you just had to give them the endorsement, give them the account number, and uh, sign it over 
and say that this needs to be processed by the chief financial officer of this corporation. But now you've got to think about this. Not all of these corporations have this understanding. Okay? Okay. Depending on what corporation you're dealing with. Whether they have a chief financial officer that has been educated high enough to have the understanding. Well, okay? The if they're a public utility, basically they should have that understanding because yeah, well, they're controlled by the state public utility board. Right. Yeah, these are all public utilities that didn't uh, react. So I, I should do the three-day notice on them to tell them to shape up. Just Man. put it in there and basically say that basically if this is not processed, okay, then you will file a complaint against the appropriate inspector general. And in a lot of cases, it's going to be the state inspector general. Okay. The state attorney general. Good. I will do that. Thank you. Patrick, I have a hypothetical situation I want to uh, ask you about. Okay. If, if, if I was able to already um, rescind my uh, Social Security contract, um, then that means I wouldn't be able to do this more the main process, would I? That's right. You haven't rescinded it yet. You haven't got the funds out of the account yet. No, okay. no, I, I just know some other people that that claim they they rescinded, and I was yeah, just... they didn't. It's, that account is still there. It's not closed. Yeah, but 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 at the end of the day, though, that would have been them fucking up for themselves, moving forward toward this uh, um, situation that you that that you're doing. Yeah, they're just trying to operate in a private with nothing. Okay. They've abandoned their access, but it's still there. Yeah, 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 I understand. It will be there until at least 10 years after they die. Until they see. Then the government can come in and claim it as abandoned funds. 10 years after you die. But since this was all set up in fraud to begin with, you can always go back after them because of fraud, and there is no statute of limitation upon fraud. See, there's beauty in understanding the truth. Truth will always shine. Fraud hides in the darkness. Any other questions? How are you, Patrick? Huh? I said, how are you? How am I? <laughs> well, I think I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question. I sent a way to get the DD-214s in regards to my husband. He was in the Army time. He got out and got into the Air Force. And then he did, uh, I think, in the reserves, okay? One of the questions I have is once he receives these, I wanted to know if he should do them one at a time. Or There's only going to be one. There's only going to be one. Okay. Okay. That's going to be the initial service that he did. Okay. That's the only time you get the military bounty is for the first two years. I see. Okay. Okay. 
All the others basically. The initial one uh, is the one that basically will uh, hold all the funds. Okay. And basically that's all the one that you need is that initial uh, DD-214. Okay. I had okay. to contact you with Missouri in order to do that. They said that it would be here, I guess, by January. And I said, okay, fine. So we're waiting for well, You can it. talk to Tom about getting a, a copy of, well, no, that was Selective Service number. You tried to get, wasn't it, Tom? Yeah, it was a Selective Service number I got. But uh, you should be able to get uh, go down to the VA Bureau or whatever and have them help you uh, expedite getting that uh, DD, copy of the DD-214 from the Veterans Affairs. And there's a Veterans I Affairs see. office in every county. Yes, there is. And I will yep. do that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, and thank see, you. He's entitled to military uh benefits at the hospital too. Oh yes he is. One hundred percent. Yeah. But uh you get a copy of that uh D G two fourteen certified from them and then you take that down and you put that into the county records and then you can draw against it. Now when Wonderful. you close down when you close down and you can close down the Social Security account by that bond that's on the back of it. You can also close down the more to main account for that military uh, DD-214. You can draw the funds out of those two more to main accounts. Now, you're not going to be getting VA benefits or Social Security benefits. Okay? You're going to have to operate in the private I see. On those. But then you can go wherever you want to at that point in time. Insurance in this country was basically banned up until 1887, I think it was. Okay, because that is a destructive force in any country is insurance. That is the banker's tool of usury. I agree with that. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. then basically the insurance companies never pay. They'll always try and argue you and try and shice you out of something. Hmm. They always try. (laughs) Yeah, because the agent is going to be getting uh, more uh, pay kickbacks if he can take mm-hmm. it away from you. I see what you're saying. So I'm going to mute out and I will be listening. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions? I just like to say I love you, man. I, I very much appreciate what you've been doing for the last, I don't even know how many years, like 2008 or even before that. You're breaking up a little. you got to speak a little clearer. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say thank you for everything you, you put out there. Um, you are the only one that has made any fucking sense, that has put out everything that they've done, that has followed through and looked at why they failed looked at where they went wrong, and in all the important things behind it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I'm over in, in Des Moines. Uh, about uh, a year ago, I had the city mess with me. I had no idea what my rights were. I had no idea about how the administrative system was set up, and I got screwed. And then... I started fighting back, started pushing back, and uh, I'm, at, I'm at a point now, I get pulled over going 50 over the speed limit on 255 a couple weeks ago, 
got out of the car, looked at me, got back in the car, and drove off. I'm only 80 miles away. I know. I'm excited. There's a, a few things I want to do, but uh, I will uh, email you. My name's Gavin. Do you uh, check that that uh, email you have under the Yahoo account? What? I didn't catch that. What did you say? I'm sorry. I'm asking kids are a little. Um, do you check the email on your Yahoo account? Uh, basically, my email account uh, is so damn full, it's uh, ridiculous. Because I wasn't right. on the Internet there for a while, and basically there's something like 70,000 70, or 7,000 or something emails there, and basically... Uh, I just set up a new email account, so basically that's where most everything I operate. It's a yeah, it's a a, a Gmail account. Okay. So I haven't booked too much there, but basically my phone number's out there uh, quite a bit, and I'll keep that for maybe another thirty days, and then I'll okay. probably just drop off the line here. Well, I was uh, contemplating giving you a call anyway. What's the best time to give you a call? Yeah. Okay. Do that. What, uh, what hours do you prefer not to be disturbed? Anytime you can try and catch me. <laughs> Thank you. Where is the file that has the Social Security um, thing that costs $192? Where is that file? You got that, Tom? No, I didn't catch it. Oh, well, where is the file that has the form we fill out that costs $192 to find out what's in our Social Security account? I forgot the form number. Uh, I have to go look look at it. 50 or something like that. I forget what the form number was, too. Okay. Okay. Will that have any details about who has gotten money from our our account? So if they're claiming that we still owe them money and we see that they've gotten it, we can tell them about it. I didn't. I didn't quite catch that again. Restated. Okay. Well, let me see. Um, will that information that we get back say? who's gotten money from our account, like let's say the IRS has gotten money from our account and they, they're they telling us that we still owe it. Can we say, well, we, it looks like here you've already gotten it? Well, basically they may have gotten it. They may not have gotten it, okay? Yeah. They're going to try it. You, you basically have no money, okay? And you don't pay out of your back pocket. Your more domain is the one that owes the money, okay? Not you. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is do one of these drafts, send it in, and that's what I did the other day. Basically, they wanted to, again, the same payment that they, I, they claim I owed back six months ago. I don't know. They may have added a little interest. I don't know. But uh, the max one of them was, was 5000 Eight hundred dollars. The minimum one uh, on the item was uh, for eight hundred some dollars. So I made out each one of these drafts for twenty five thousand, a negative twenty five thousand. I said, okay, you take out your funds and you deposit the remainder, the residue, into my Direct Express card. So I put in a total of one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. They should be taking out roughly about twenty-five thousand, so they should be depositing a hundred and fifty thousand into my Direct Express card. Can they do that? Yes, because if they can deposit seventy-three thousand into my Direct Express card, roughly uh, four months ago, they can do a hundred and fifty thousand. They can do more than that into that Direct Express card. 
and see this uh, Bureau of Fiscal Services is also the one that gives the final approval for issuing that direct express card. Go into their website and you'll see that. That basically the direct express card is right there on that Bureau of Fiscal Services. And see, that's under the uh, Kansas City or the Philadelphia Finance Center, which is also part of the uh, financial management system. Well, thank you. What? Thank you. Okay. Patrick, I have a question. Okay. Um, while Mac, you were talking about the, a bond that the manufacturer put on the car that you got and that you uh, requested that bond, and I was curious if uh, I have a little sister in law that has a lease vehicle, is there a bond on that? <coughs> There's a bond on it, and basically, if on the lease vehicle, you don't have a state-issued title, do you? No. no. The state-issued title is being controlled by the leasing organization. Right. Okay. Uh, how about on her husband's uh, finance truck? Is there a bond on that? Yes. The bank is controlling that one, and basically there's also, you see, the c- certificate of origin, okay, from the, like, Ford Motor Company or from Chrysler or whoever, their credit department issued a bond to get the funds to build that car. They needed to have the money to buy the parts to put that car together. Yes. So Um. that is the bond, and basically the red number that's on that uh, title of origin Okay, that is the bond number. You okay. normally don't see that. I ended right. up getting that because I went in and I paid outright for that vehicle. I said, I will take this document down to the county and pay the taxes and register it if it's required by law. The funny thing is, it's not required by law. Hmm. It's a voluntary filing. Everything has to be voluntary. So you don't need to register your vehicle with the state. The only ones that have to have it registered is if you're operating in the commercial world for hire or for profit. And this car that I have is doing neither one of those. Hmm. On on, on, uh, her husband's, uh, he he bought a used uh, pickup truck and financed it. So there is a bond on the financing? Yes, and basically you've got a state bond on it too. Oh. That certificate of title that the state gives you, it's got a red number on it. That's a bond QCIP number. Look at uh-huh. it. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. That's, and that see, that's, that's, a, that's the same thing on most everything you have that's issued by the state. You've got a certificate of title to the house. It's under a state bond. And basically, those are normally controlled by the state insurance division or department. Hey, Patrick, I got a question about that. Yeah. I uh, I bought my house through um, a company out of Omaha. I paid them 1500 for the deed, and then I paid city back taxes because I didn't know any better than them. Uh, registered it through them. I never got a certificate of anything back from the, the county. And I have been paying taxes and fucking with them every step of the way. 
but uh, why is it I don't have a certificate? You've got to go down and find out whether that company has a lien against that property. There are no liens against did, property. You didn't get a clear title, did you? Uh, I could, it was a, uh, a quick claim. Yeah, against it, somebody it, else's property, right? It would have been. But they, they yeah. had actually taken possession of it. They had had it for years. They took years. possession, but did they get a clear title to that property? Did the other uh, party properly sign it over to them? Clearly not, then. That's right. You've got to make sure and go in and do a title search and find out what the problem is. Yeah, thank you. That's one of the key things. When you start getting these funds out of your Mortemain account, then you go out and you buy these things outright. You get the clear title. You don't re up. You keep it in the private, and it's, everything is being bought under your private bank, not you. You buy it in the name of your private bank. Like in my case, Patrick Devine, private bank, E&T, owns this car that I'm sitting in right now. I, as the living, do not own it. It's my private bank that owns it. And I know that now. At the time, I didn't. Okay. See, that way you keep it out of the state's hands, and it is totally in the private. My current use is without title, without registration, with the proper ownership. Right. You don't need a driver's license because you're not a driver. You're not operating for hire or for profit. Absolutely. I agree. And that's that's my defense. And you know, any time that I'm I'm asked anything, I don't consent to anything ever. Yeah, but you've got to know, and basically you've got to have the proper understandings of this, otherwise you're just like a baby crying I, I, I walk and need your diapers changed, okay? I know. I walked away from a domestic assault investigation a couple weeks ago. Okay, you don't argue with them. They see if need be, you, you let your Mortimane account pay for everything. Well, then you take their bond to zero. Until you take it totally out, and then you will be totally out of the system, and you will be sitting in a different system altogether. I don't know if I'm quite ready for that one, but... Uh, okay. No, you've got to get some funds out of your account. Then you, as soon as you have the funds, and see, like I was trying to tell this one lady, I said, mm-hmm. everybody's out here trying to go and get a passport. I need to have this passport. Well, basically, yeah. the passport you're going to get it's not going to be the right one, period, yeah. because yeah. you're still in the system. Okay? Exactly. When you get yeah. out and basically, do you need a passport? No. No. Absolutely not. Hell, most of the people operate with the Bible as their passport to go around the world. Up until the 1920s or 19-teens, then they started bringing in these uh, United States passports because they were making people citizens of the corporate United States. Yeah. Okay? But uh, one other thing, basically, you can go anywhere in the world if you've got the money. Mm-hmm. Money talks. Money will open up doors that you will not believe. I'm not afraid of that. And I... I don't understand why people are, are just so fucking stuck in, in what they've been indoctrinated to. Well, it's because that's their belief now. Basically, people have to change their beliefs and get back to the real, true understanding. We've been operating under this false religion too damn long. And you were right earlier, it, it is all about fear. Yeah. Because then you don't think, then you don't act, then you you just take it. 
and you give them your energy freely. And, and now, see, all that we're doing is we're walking around in this corporate structure as a customer. And guess what? The customer is always right. Yeah, someone needs to tell them that again. <laughs> as long as you don't farm their stuff, you're in the right. Yeah. Walmart can't charge you for running down the aisle. <laughs> okay? But if you run down the aisle and you knock a bunch of stuff off the shelf and it breaks, you're going to be held liable. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, call tonight, Tom. Thank you very much, Patrick. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Okay.